calm has returned to the streets of Sri Lanka's commercial capital, Colombo. This as uh, the president, Kotabaya Rajapaksa, uh, has agreed to resign this after his house was stormed by protesters amid outrage over the South Asia nation's collapsing economy. The news of his resignation was uh, well received by jubilant anti-government crowds. Protesters, many wrapped in the Sri Lanka flag, swarmed into the president's whitewashed colonial era residence at the weekend. They jumped into the swimming pool and sat on a four poster bed, while others set fire to the private home of Prime Minister Ranin Wilkerame Singhe. He has since agreed to resign to make way for an all party government. The parliament speaker says Raja Baksa, a hero of the quarter century civil war against Tamil rebels, plans to resign on Wednesday. Raja Baksa is set to resign after months of mismanaging the crisis, a dramatic escalation of largely peaceful anti-government protests on the island that sits near key shipping lanes. Sri Lanka's economic crisis developed after the COVID-19 pandemic hammered the tourism-reliant economy and slashed remittances from overseas workers. Fuel prices in Sri Lanka are at an all-time high as shortages in the country hiked up diesel prices to $1.29 per litre. Petrol prices touch $1.37 per litre, sending locals queuing up outside fuel stations for days. The government has asked people to work from home in closed schools in an effort to conserve fuel. Uh, we think we have responsibility to clean the, uh, this area because uh, this is public area. Uh, public money uh, so uh, that's why we did uh, uh, because uh, 92 days we protest uh, in gold face as a uh, youth center uh, so uh, we believe system change we should uh, our generation should do the uh, system change uh, we think this is a part of the system change. Though Kamez returned to the streets of Colombo, Kura Sri Lankans roam through the ransacked presidential palace. All right, let's get the latest on the situation. We're joined now by Mabrur Ahmed, who is director and founder of UK-based international human rights organization, Restless Beings. A very good evening to you, Mabrur. So let's just first start with uh, what is the latest news that you're hearing there from Sri Lanka? Good evening, thank you for having me. Um, I think there's, there's, there's many things that, that we can discuss. First of all, of course, the, the presidential palace was stormed. Um, the prime minister's office was also stormed. Um, we're, we're hearing news about the, the president stepping down on Wednesday, as well as the prime minister offering to do so as well. Um, there is relative calm uh, compared to the weekend. But I think, of course, despite all of the mayhem and the melee that we might have seen over the last sort of 48 hours or so, you know, the real instability in the country still remains at large. You know, there's still a huge uh, inflation issue. There's still a huge fuel crisis. There's still a food crisis as well. Um, and at the moment, it seems like a ship without any anyone steering it right now. You know, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty about what the coming days, weeks and months hold. Mm. So we've been hearing rumours or reports of uh, the president going into exile, as you uh, mentioned, and uh, as we said in our introduction, that he has agreed to step down. But what of uh, the prime minister? He is being targeted as well. Yeah, so I mean, even about uh, President Rajapaksa, um, there, you know, there has been reports that he's out of the country. There are reports that he's maybe under the same sort of protection that his brother had when he was ousted from the prime minister's office in, in May earlier this year. Um, you know, there's still a, a huge kind of question mark over whether Rajapaksa enjoys um, kind of the, the, the security of the Navy and of the army as well. Uh, most likely, yes. Um, it's unlikely that um, the last 48 hours have necessarily seen such a sea change um, from, from, from an army and, uh, you know, that, that was essentially led by Rajapaksa uh, prior to him taking the presidential role. So far as Wickremesinghe is concerned, the prime minister, he's also, you know, through the speaker of the house has also made a uh, commentary in the sense that you know that they, he will step down as will the the president but he's also said that you know he feels that there is a job still to do um that he would like to remain um a, in some sort of form or shape until there's a new government that's been elected he feels that it's the right thing to do to hand over from one government to another government but it's quite clear that you know both the president and the prime minister have lost any sort of mandate that they might have had 
with the people and 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 you know as you said as as you as we heard from the VT clip you know people are are, are looking for a change now they they they're wanting something systemically changed no, um, we'll talk, and i think you know, we'll talk about the socio economic conditions that uh, sri lankans face on a daily basis but i just want to get the latest piece of news out of the way we've heard from the speaker of parliament that parliament will reconvene on the 15th and that uh, a new president will be chosen um, or some sort of elective process will go underway, will get underway. So the opposition leader, Sajith Premadasa, says the opposition is ready to lead the program of stabilizing the country and building the country's economy. So what kind of process is going to uh, lead us to that? And does the opposition enjoy that mandate given the current circumstances? I mean, uh, according to all logic, yes, the opposition parties can probably come together. If all the oppositions come together, they can probably, um, you know, reach the 113 uh, seat mark that they need in order to kind of form a new government. But we're talking about people from all political persuasions on the on the opposition party to come together against a party which has very recently, 2019, 2020 elections, we're not talking about, you know, five years ago. Um, it's quite a recent uh, mandate that, that was won by Roger Paksa. Um, so yes, of course, there is, uh, by all intents and purposes, there is the, 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 the mechanism is there for a new government to be formed. Um, how that new government forms and the process of that new government forming, I think is more of an opportunity for Sri Lanka to kind of uh, draw a line under the the, the rule of the Rajapaksas um, since you know kind of the early 2000s and until now, and to really kind of uh, bring forward a new dawn for Sri Lanka. But I'm not a hundred percent sure. I would not say with with certainty that the current sitting opposition parties combined together that coalition. It's too broad a coalition, I would say, to be able to to unite together to form. A government. I mean, yes, they can form together to say that definitely Raja Paksa no longer holds the mandate, but I'm not sure that they are, uh, you know, quite narrow together enough in their policies and politics to be able to lead a government. And I think the opposition leader is using uh, the moral premise to, uh, you know, com or coalesce the opposition in totality because uh, he says anyone opposing uh, this measure will it will be a subversive action uh, from uh, what parliament is intending to do and all of this will be considered an act of treason and uh, I, I believe that party leaders have noted that the need to act as per the presidential elections, the special provisions of Act Number no. Two of 1981, uh, within a short period of time, allows for this. Uh, are you in agreement? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, the way that Sri Lankan politics has played itself over the last 20, 25 years has very much been an aggressive way. I think, of course, um, as in Sri Lanka, as it is in many countries, the idea of some sort of caretaker government, which is brought together by a number of individuals who hold some sort of um, national reconciliation effort, if you like, um, is a good idea. And it's something that can probably steady the ship for now. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily a, the wisest idea, even though the constitution may allow for a very rapid presidential election to necessarily head into that territory because like as, as you mentioned we'll come to these issues um very very shortly but the reason why rajapaksa was ousted so dramatically is because sri lanka itself is going through a huge number of crises um, and those crises don't disappear just because of a change of leadership there needs to be more that happens in order for that to kind of be uh, calmed down mm. Now, just to share your thoughts about the the protagonists of what led to this situation. As in the main culprits, the chief government whip, uh, Prasanna Ratunga, has stated that if an all-party government uh, will be formed, even as early as tomorrow, the entire cabinet led by the prime minister is ready to step down. Do they all bear equal responsibility for the situation? I mean, and I say this against the backdrop of what we hear here in South Africa, where individuals uh, are fingered as being problematic, 
in areas of maladministration or, or failing the mandate through which they came through. Uh, but you know, in times of trouble, they then stand behind this issue of collective leadership. So it's almost like a moving target. Uh, is this the case in Sri Lanka? Is there collective leadership where you should, where one should say the entire cabinet should step down out of uh, the fact that they all took uh, these collective decisions? I mean, I think that it's a, it's a good comparison. South Africa is a very good comparison. And I think a, a great many countries around the world find themselves in the same sort of situation currently in terms of, you know, fuel crises, et cetera, and food prices, and kind of coming out of the pandemic, and also with the uncertainty of the war in Russia as well. All of these things, of course, are global events, and, and they have impacts on, on individual countries and, and their economies alike. Um, I think, you know, it's... It, Look, the last 25 years or so, we've seen the Rajapaksa brothers um, essentially hold, holding some sort of monopoly over whether it's over government, whether it's over the military, but in, tot in totality kind of, you know, kind of steering really the political movement of Sri Lanka. Um, yes, absolutely, the cabinet should step down because, you know, as much as we can blame individuals there, you know, the, the, the way that politics works around the world is that these are collective decisions that happen and many steps along the way enable for policies to be enacted. Um, so, for example, the fuel crisis, the food crisis in Sri Lanka, is not down to just one individual or two individuals or even a group of five or ten individuals or just a cabinet. It's down to an entire kind of system which has enabled such power to be held um, by the presidential office. You know, we know that there's many, many parts of the governance structure of Sri Lanka, which is essentially held by the gov uh, by the president's office. That in itself is probably, you know, something which in the modern day era is is is, is impossible to govern. Um, and 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 especially with the ethnic diversity, with the with the problems that have been held in terms of, you know, the the, the ethnic mismatch and the, the the discord that's been set into play. The idea that Rajapaksa came in under a nationalist agenda. There are many, many different things that, that lead up to the final manifestation of people being in absolute devastation and, and, and misery to the point that they are forcibly kind of removing a president and a prime minister from office. That has to be the absolute final and last step. Um, anything more than that is, is dangerous, not just for the country, but for, for the region as well. The next steps that follow um, are reconciliation steps. So okay. yes, absolutely. You know, there should be, yes. What are the people of uh, Sri Lanka facing on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of the socio-economic struggles? The Church of Ceylon, for instance, was amongst the first to call for the immediate resignation of the Prime Minister, who they said never had the legitimacy to hold office, uh, saying that there has been no clear plan or indication or action to revive the economy other than people having to tighten their belts and die in queues. So how does it manifest uh, this uh, socio-economic struggle that people have been fighting and trying to push back against? Because we can talk about it in broad terms, but what is the worst that people have had to face? Yeah. So I think, you know, for, for, for a lot of the population, maybe 20, 30 percent of the population, they're absolutely dependent on the tourist economy. Now, of course, that's been obliterated over the last two and a half years or so. Um, so there's already a slowdown. There's already a kind of uh, a tightening of belts, as you like, uh, by, by a lot of people who, who, who are in that industry. On top of that, when you have the fuel shortages that, that Sri Lanka has seen, I think it's perhaps the only country in the world where literally fuel had been stopped. No one was allowed to buy fuel. There was no fuel at the at the fuel pumps. Um, and then on top of that, the idea that the, the 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 remaining part of Sri Lanka is very much an agricultural country, where even things like fertilizer had to be shipped in from India. So we're talking about uh, a, a people who have no way of getting about. They have very little access to improve their uh, economic condition because the, it just hasn't turned up for the last two and a half years. We're talking about a people who are also then reliant on agriculture being basically uh, waiting on, on handouts from, from other countries. Like I said, India um, uh, shipped in some, some fertilizer. We're talking about very, very extreme measures, like an extreme form of austerity that, that that's not really seen um, anywhere else in the world. And, and on, the, on, on the basis of all of these things, you have a country, therefore, where a president is asking the people to work from home. And it's virtually impossible because this is not an economy set up to work from home. Mm -hmm. um, and so you have a president and a administration 
which is largely out of touch with the rest of the country and is not listening to the people, is not aware of the people's malay that they are facing on a day-to-day -day basis, who are not able to feed their families, who are not able to go and see their families, who are not able to send their children to school. And so what's naturally going to come as a result is this form of expression, this form of protest, this form of civil uh, disobedience, if you like, and this call for a, for a reconciliation.